My contribution to this book is very modest because of my ill health, I've not been able to write too much. It comprised mainly of the statement which I made when I was in prison in 1972 after nine years of incarceration. As you know, I was detained in the cold store operation in February 2nd, 1963, and I was the last one to come out from that batch of detainees almost 20 years later. Now, this statement mainly stated my stand on my detention. After nine years of incarceration, they wanted me to issue a statement to firstly support the so-called democratic system in Singapore and secondly to renounce politics. I told them that these two demands are contra contradictory, self-contradictory. Because if there is voluntary democracy, then I don't have to give up politics. So the receipt must say something to show repentance. Otherwise, the party will lose face. <laughs> this is not a question of pride, it's a question of principle. In the first place, the person has to save his face by depriving somebody else of his fundamental rights, then that's not a face that's worth saving. So, to me, the democratic rights is a fundamental constitutional right of the people of Singapore. And no one should be deprived of their right and held to ransom to extort statements of repentance and condition. So, the whole thing brought down to having to issue a statement of repentance, which I refused. Subsequently, I was detained for another over 10 years after that statement was issued. So a total of 19 years and 8 months, longer than a life sentence. Life sentence will be reduced after 13 years after the usual one trip initial. But for no charge, no trial, I was detained for longer than a life sentence. A lot of Kolaboru uh, has been said recently on the right of the poor detainees to appeal to an advisory board. I want to tell you my experience about this advisory board. After about one year of detention, I was asked to go to the prison main gate at about 4 p.m. I was given a notice to say that I had to appear before the press board the next day. I was given a full full step paper of so-called charge sheets. I said I want to keep this sheet of paper so I prepare for my next morning's appearance. He said, no, you cannot keep it. You just read it and you take it. I said, I want to inform my lawyer about this. He said, no, because I have to inform my lawyer because I cannot tell the phone for me now. I said, in that case, how do I contact my lawyer? He said, that's the law. <laughs> so the next morning, I was called to the high court to hunt handcuffs and all that. And I appeared before a university board comprising of three persons. A judge called Judge Louis Lo and two other persons. One is a certain Elias, and I think is a lawyer. And another tiny gentleman, and his name I cannot remember. So, on this so-called charge sheet, there are a lot of blank spaces. I asked Judge Winslow, what does this uh, blank spaces mean? He said, oh, these are charges which are so sensitive that they are shown only to the advisory board and not to you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what the hell can anybody defend himself against a charge that's not even to do to him? And I asked him by advice. He just said, okay. I said, is this a mockery or a judgment or what? He said, this is the law. Okay. I said, the whole thing is a judicial task. I mean, it's incredible that anyone has to face this kind of mockery, this kind of so-called justice. And the fact that a high court judge is being put as a chairman of this advisory board gives the public an illusion that there is judgment, there is justice. And I told him that if I were a high court judge, I will not lend credence to this mockery by my presence. 
then this Elias threatened me to compare the court. I was very happy when he threatened me to compare the court because after all I was very interested in transferring from one to go to another. By the way, in my 20 years in prison, I was gained in practically all the prisons in Singapore except of course the female prison. <laughs> And then the judge says, no, no, let the doctor have to say. There's no question of the court. So I gave a three hour statement to, to debunk all the so-called charges. One of the charges was in fact a false judge. It was charged for being one of the eight father students who were charged for this, this uh, sedition. And so as a matter of fact, I didn't have the privilege to be one of the eight. In fact, I would feel better to be one of the eight. And then I was not one of the eight. And so so why should I be given for allegedly to be one of the eight when these eight were acquitted without the case being called and acquitted and defended by Lee Kuan Yew himself who is now detaining me? And so this the law. Everything is the law. So recently we have heard all this so-called rule of law. Now there is a detention without trial and ISA, a law which makes a mockery of the concept of rule of law. The rule is a law that is outside the rule of law. Once you are detained under the ISA, you have no legal defense whatsoever. I tried the habeas corpus twice. On one occasion, I succeeded for a technical error on the side of the government. They did not sign my detention order. It was supposed to be signed by a minister, but it was dedicated to a civil servant. So, on that account, the court has to release me on a technical, technical point. So, when I was released, there were the special ones waiting for me outside the Queenstown prison. I was rearrested. One minute later. It's a mock to this. And for that heaviest corpus, I was punished by being sent to the most hideous of all detention centers, the Central Police Station headquarters. That was a place that is not fit to keep human beings, I mean, animals, let alone human beings. It was a place was so dark, so stingy, and so ill ventilated that. You cannot stand inside for more than 24 hours. But I was locked in there for 24 hours a day. And the whole place was infested with bugs. I had a lot of bugs for company. There was no reading material. The lights were so dim that I could hardly see the crease on my hand. So immediately, the five of us were there, <coughs> went on hunger strike. And my ulcer bled, and I had to be transferred to the hospital. <coughs> that was the so-called habeas corpus right that you had. You tried it at your own risk of being severely punished. The second time I went to Harris to the habeas corpus case is when they tried to force me to do manual labor. That was in 1972. They said all the should do manual labor as a program of rehabilitation. I was supposed to do carpentry. So this, this uh, superintendent told me, it's good for you as a doctor, you try to become more dexterous with your hands. <laughs> so I said, you do not have the qualification to enter a medical college. And here you're trying to tell a doctor what is good for postgraduate education. Are you overreaching yourself? So he said, this is a lot. We have to we pay you eight cents a day. So we all went on hunger strike. And some of us went on hunger strike for three months in order to frustrate the attempt to make us laborers like criminals. I went on hunger strike for three weeks before they came in and said, okay, we examine you from there. The women detainees in the new present center went on hunger strike for 130 days. <coughs> and uh, they were forced fed. Some of them wanted after being fed by the, the, the milk by the tube. 
inserted forcibly into their use of vehicles. One girl vomited, and uh, the, the superintendent forced four waters to carry her and wipe the floor with her pants. This is the kind of treatment method to detainees. All this, of course, suppressed in the press. But there's a thing that we all had to go through. You know, all of us had to go through this detention in solitary confinement. Now, solitary confinement, according to Lee Kuan himself, is a very bad form of torture. I'll read to you what Lee Kuan said about solitary confinement. The biggest punishment a man can receive is total isolation. In a dungeon, black and complete withdrawal of all stimuli. That is real torture. Lee Kuan Yew, January 2008. Although he knows that is real torture, he has no compunction in meeting out this real torture to all detainees without exception. Some of us had to undergo this real torture, not for two days, three days, but for six months. Now, under the law, there is a protection for even criminal prisoners from this kind of torture. A prisoner, a criminal prisoner, when found guilty of infringing prison rules, will be sentenced to sort confinement for not more than two weeks because of the obvious mental ill health effects. But for political detainees, there is no protection. The Li Mao Li Yu Sing, the director general, the, 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 the general manager of Nanyang Sampao, was put into solitary confinement not once but twice. And it was to his credit, he stood that kind of real torture. Titi Raja, a lawyer, who was detained for two and a half years, was put under solitary confinement for six months, twice. Said Jahari was put under solitary confinement four times in his long 17 years of detention. Now, it is to our credit that we did not break down in spite of this real torture. We stood our ground and held on to our integrity. Today, we are asking us to be magnanimous. What does magnanimity mean? Only those who have suffered has the moral right moral standing to be magnanimous, not the culprit. The culprit can seek forgiveness if they admit their mistakes and uh, apologize for it. Not for, the, not for the victims of this torture to seek forgiveness. We are the ones who have to be magnanimous and we are prepared to be magnanimous to widen the culprits, admit their mistakes and seek our forgiveness. In my statement that I released to the press in 1932 through my wife of the British Chen, and which was of course suppressed by the newspapers, but was distributed a lot to, to all student organizations. I say the proper way to settle our case is that uh, we must release us without conditions. Un unconditional release and moreover we must compensate us for a long detention and also apologize. I say I'm prepared to forgo these two last conditions of having to compensate us and also having to apologize to us. Because I don't believe an arrogant man like this one will was conceded to and the question of release unconditionally that we stand firm. I stood firm and have to suffer for two decades. That is the price that we pay for our integrity. In Singapore, we have a situation where the common leaders said they have integrity that has to be sustained by the highest pay in the world. Now that they demand from political opponents and detainees an integrity that has to sustain the longest imprisonment in the world. This kind of two types of integrity, to compare them is to compare heaven and earth. Why should anybody have to sacrifice so much 
trust to sustain his integrity and his beliefs. And government can have to reward themselves with so much high pay. This is the immorality of the political institution as it was today. Now, detention without trial is not a peaceful action. It's an act of violence. We come to see you not in the day night with the invitation card. We come in the morning, 4 a.m. is the usual time. That's a time when decent people sleep and the political terrorists and tyrants strike. And when you're detained, you're subjected to all kinds of mental and even physical torture. This is not only unique for the 1963 batch, it was also practiced in many other batches of detention, 1972, and as late as 1987, with Jo Run and her group of so-called Marxist detainees were subjected to physical and mental and physical torture. Ms. Jo Run is here. I hope she will come up and dictate to her how her batch had been tortured physically. We are women lawyers, and the women lawyers can be subjected to torture. Now, when these women lawyers came out and issued a statement to describe how they have been tortured, they were again detained and compelled to withdraw the accusation. Now, what type of rule of law is there when the accuser can be punished by the accused, that's the government, and compelled to withdraw? the accusation. It's a no rule of law of justice turned upside down. Now this is a situation that even the law of society dare not utter a word of protest. They are so important after what they have done to the law of society in 1987. Now, Mosukai has written a very good article on the Operation Coastal. In, deep, in that, he has revealed a lot of declassified British archives documents showing how the British and Lee Kuan Yew conspired and uh, collaborated to put political uh, to crush the opposition before the 1963 general elections. The whole aim of this merger was to crush the opposition before the 1963 elections. And today the PAP is standing on high moral ground, demanding human rights in other countries, even demanding the release of the two detainees in Myanmar. What well, precisely me on what moral grounds are still standing to have this demand. When you examine their past records, they are standing on a pedestal that is leaking with worms and worms. Let them repent first their own dismal record of human rights, and then they may have the moral right to cast explosions on other people's lack of moral or of human rights. Musukai uh, has also written the last chapter of this book <coughs> about the future of socialism. Many of you may wonder what is the relevance of socialism in this era. Uh, after 50 years when the club was formed, the socialist movement all over the world has suffered a lot of setbacks, even defeats, and some wonder whether we are still relevant. The recent economic crisis, the recent financial crisis has once again exploded the corruption and the immorality of the capitalist system. And we feel that human beings should deserve something better than a system that is generated by greed and by corruption. Now, some of you may have heard that when you are young, you are idealistic, and you're old, 
you know, be anything. So this is a kind of rubbish that we use by those who have either lost their ideals or have sold their ideals for self-interest. Each should not wither one's ideals or convictions. If anything, it should only consolidate and make it more resolute. If each has anything to do with it, it is only by way of expression and application of these ideals and convictions, <coughs> having experience from the benefit, we have the benefit of the useful experiences. Uh, life without convictions, without idealism, is a mere meaningless existence. And I'm sure most of you will agree that as human beings, you are worthy of a life much more meaningful than just that. Thank you.